Hi everyone, uh, my name is Curran, and um, tonight's tutorial is about splitting charts. So let me just show you what I'm going to cover, like sort of fast paced. We're going to, I'm assuming that you sort of know the material from this previous uh, screencast I did called Introduction to D3, where, which covered this bar chart example, this line chart example, and this scatter plot. And what I'm going to cover here is how to take a, a single bar and split it into multiple bars, you know, horizontally like this, and then also how to split it uh, vertically like this, and then split that even further to be um, a stacked bar chart like this, where there's multiple stacked bars, and then adding a color legend, doing grouped bars, and then doing a, a circular version sort of of the same thing where, where we can create a pie chart and then a donut chart and then do like small multiples of these different pie chart variants. And then also I'm going to cover uh, line charts and how to make a line chart with multiple lines like this. And then also an area chart and then splitting an area chart into a stacked area chart. So before I talk about the visualizations, let me introduce the data that I'll be using. So I'm using uh, two data sets. One of them is population data from the United Nations. And this is the kind of data that you see if you Google, uh, what's the population of China? So if you Google, what's the population of China? This is what you get. They did this really nice visualization work. So it says China, India, US, and this is a line chart of the populations of these various countries. And so I've I've prepared these different CSV files. This is like this is the current world population. This is the world population by year from 1950 to 2015. I got the updated version. And then uh, population by country by year. So this is the population data. And then there, another data set is um, from the Pew Research Center that collects data about religions. And um, it's from this, this report that they did, the global religious landscape. So it's like, of the world population, what are the various um, proportions of different religions through the world and then broken down by country? So here's, yeah, religion by country. And I just took the, f the, the top five countries of the world. So it's a small, manageable data set. So here's like in China and in India, the US, Indonesia, and Brazil. These are the top five largest countries in the world. So for these, we have the, the religious uh, breakdowns. So this is the data that we're going to be looking at. And let me just uh, dive right into the examples. Question. Yeah, meta question. So you're going to show various visualization. But what's the motivation? What's the motivation for this? Yeah, right. I mean, so from from my personal standpoint, I've been working on this project called Chiasm for the past eight months at Alpine. This is an open source thing. And I've added uh, really only a few visualization types into this, but I want to make it a general system. And so these are sort of, this is what I've explored so far. It's like line chart, bar chart, <clears throat> and scatterplot, pretty much. And scatterplot has these different variations. But a lot of the data that you come across um, can't be expressed in these charts. It has like maybe another dimension of data. And so I've seen these various different kinds of visualizations that exist, like small multiples, and stacked bar charts, grouped bar charts, and uh, things like that. And I want, I want to integrate those kinds of visualizations into this Chiasm project. Uh, so then it'll be like more of an open source, uh, almost like a Tableau-like uh, thing that's open source. So yeah, that's that's basically the theme, is like once you introduce another dimension of data, how does that introduction of another dimension correspond to the visual presentation of it? You know, how can you modify a bar chart uh, and a circle and a line to accommodate an additional dimension of data? And if you want to do like visualization of big data, 
usually what you need to do is reduce the data first and compute like a data cube, an OLAP cube. And all the data sets that we're going to show here is essentially a data cube. And that's what you get when you aggregate over, you know, massive amounts of data. And that's usually how it's how how big data gets presented in tools like Tableau or ClickView and that sort of thing. So I'm assuming that you understand uh, this code for this bar chart. Um, and I'm also assuming you understand the code for this line chart with the axes and everything. So these, these are the visualizations covered in this previous tutorial, Introduction to D3, which there's a big video about. This is a whole other set of examples that sort of build up to those. There's like 107 examples. So using that as our starting point, let's explore this theme of splitting the charts with an additional dimension of data. So let's say we just have a single number that we want to present, the population of the world. Uh, we can represent the population of the world as a single bar. And so this is a modification of that previous bar chart example that shows this number, population of the world. And so you can see it's a CSV file that has one entry, you know, the world population. And uh, the only modification I had to do to the bar chart example is right here, it's loading in this new file. And then at the top, I modified the columns to correspond to the data table. And uh, I'm going to sort of take a side route about customizing a number, the number format right now. Because the first thing I saw is like, it says 2G, 4G, 6G, and what's G? You know, I... If I were to present this to somebody, they'd be like, what's G, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, 4G, it's like a better cell phone, right? Um, and so I'm like, well, okay, I just want to change this to be billions, like B, 2B, 2 billion. Uh, so this is using the, uh, where is it in here? It's the, the tick format for the y-axis is D3 format S, which is the um, SI standard standard uh, standard abbreviation. So G means giga, which really means billion. So if we wanted to change this to say B instead of G, uh, here's how we could do it. So on the number format, the tick format that you pass into tick format of D3 is really a function that gets called for every element of the data. And so here's a custom tick format function it takes as input an element, and then it just it uses the SI format. The output of this will be like 2G or 4G, and then it's just a string replacement operation that replaces G with B. So there's a little sort of side, side road of how, how do you customize a number format to display B instead of G. So, so now it's like more acceptable to me. Like, you know, 2, 2B is 2 billion. So the, you can see the world population is around 7 billion right now. Right, so, so this, is, this is the world population for the entire world. But let's, uh, let's break it down a little bit. So now I'm going to look at the top five countries of the world. So I just did a filter you know, on the United Nations population data. What are the top five? Here they are. And here's the population. So you can see like China and India are about the same size. And then the US is like a lot smaller than that. And then it sort of tapers off Indonesia and Brazil. So just this by itself, I was, you know, it's pretty interesting to look at this and realize how much bigger India and China are than the U.S. It's pretty, pretty extreme. But anyway, in, in the code, the only real thing that's different is the data here. And, you know, this, this line has been changed and the X column is now country. That's the only stuff that's changed because this bar chart was written in a general way, so you can change it like this. Yeah. Ticks were set to five before, and now I see there's more than five ticks. So, what was the purpose of setting them to a number? So you said ticks was set to five here, yeah. and it still is. But when you call dot ticks here, you're you're specifying an approximate number of ticks, not an exact number. And then it will get as, you know, the way that the D3 axis is implemented, it will get as close to this number as it can, with having nice numbers. So like 0, 200, 400, rather than like if you were to split the interval into exactly five bins, you would get these like, you know, 5.372 like weird 
not nice numbers. So even though I specified five here in the code, it, it'll give me maybe more than five up there. Yeah, it'll get as close as it can. So here's splitting the world basically into these five separate bars. And this is not all the population. Um, so this is exploring, yeah, splitting by population. But what if we split by religion? So here's what that looks like. The data set here is um, these various different religions, the totals for the whole world population. And I just changed the bar chart to use this data, but then we run into this problem of overlapping labels. And this is a problem that's plagued me a lot because um, at Alpine we're trying to build t visualizations that will work on any input, right? And if you make a bar chart like this, it, it, the, the visualization has to have like something more intelligent where it will not have these overlapping labels. So let me just take another detour here of how to deal with this problem. So one thing you could do is make them small enough so that they don't overlap, right? Just so I changed the CSS here. The font size is five points now. But uh, you can't read them, so that's not acceptable, right? So another solution is to tilt them. So here's what it looks like when you just tilt them. Uh, they're readable and they don't overlap. So this is like, you know, it's a it's a reasonable solution for me. And I just basically Googled, how do you have a tilted labels? And I came up with this uh, blog post, which is really good. And um, you just use a transform on the text element of the ticks. And so over here in the code, you can see where it's been modified. Um, so when you call x-axis-g.call x-axis, this invocation creates these text elements here and all the tick marks. And so after that's been called, that gives you a D3 selection. And so based on that, you can say dot select all text. That will give you a, a D, another D3 selection that has all of the text elements selected. And so then you can work with those and and set the transform of each of these text elements to be rotated by minus 20 degrees. So this is another little detour. How do you do tilted labels so that the labels don't overlap? But anyway, what we get is a bar chart of world religions. So you can see like the, the most popular religion is the world is, in the world is Christianity. And then uh, the order is Christian, Muslim, unaffiliated is number three. I thought that was interesting. And then Hindu, Buddhist, folk religions, other religions, and, and Jewish uh, is the, the yeah, smallest. I think maybe the name of the religion would be Islam, not Muslim. Muslim the... Right. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. I, I just took this data. I didn't I didn't come up come up with these, but yeah, I guess Muslim should be Islam. Yeah, I don't know. I just sort of took what, what was there, and I thought, well, they can they can deal with what's politically correct, you know. <laughs> we have to fix this. It's a visualization problem, right? <laughs> but anyway, these are like these are the two main dimensions dimensions that we'll be splitting by today, religion and country. And so now what I want to do really is instead of, instead of splitting the bars horizontally, I want to split it vertically. So the previous example shows the, the world as a single bar. I want to split that vertically to just see how you can do it with D3. And so um, if we do that, we need to be able to, dis to distinguish between the different layers. And so before we actually do the splitting, we're going to add color. So make, make everything color-coded. So let me just show you how, how that's done. It's using this d3.scale.category10 as these colors, this, these canned, this canned set of nice colors um, that, that come with the ship with D3, pretty much. And so this will give you uh, an ordinal scale where the the range is these uh, this set of colors. So let's see what it looks like. And so I've introduced an, a new variable here called color column. 
which in this case is the same as x column, but I made it this variable just to deal with it, and, you know, just with the bits of code that deal with the color. So color column is religion. And then here we're saying the color scale is d3.scale.category10, so we can use it. And then in the render function, we're setting the domain of the color scale, so the, the input values, to be data.map. So for each element of the data, and remember data is read in from the CSV file, so there's one data entry per uh, religion. So data.map function d return d uh, at the color column. So it will this will return the religion, the value for religion. So d at color column will be Christian or Muslim or unaffiliated. And so this will be the domain of the color scale. And then when we make the bars, we're adding another attribute here, the fill, which is the color. And we're just evaluating the color scale based on the value for the color column. It's following a similar pattern for, from the X scale and the Y scale. So yeah, this is how we can add add color, you know, make the bars color coded. So you have the default over there. What if I wanted to like cooler or whatever and I have my other so how would you make custom colors? Yeah, to have that default, to have a set of different um, color scales, either the default or custom color scales. Oh, if you, wanted to, if you wanted to change the color scale dynamically? So maybe to answer the question a little bit, like to scratch the surface, of if you wanted to define a custom set of colors. So when you call d3.scale.category10 right here, you're, this is really doing like d3.scale.ordinal, like that, and then once you have an ordinal scale, you can say color scale dot uh, range and give it an array of colors. And these are CSS colors, so you could do things like this, red, green, but you could also define like the six digits, yep. six hex digits. This is how you could define your own custom colors. Cool. And then if you wanted it dynamic, you could set the range dynamically based on some drop down menu or something and then call the render function again to set it dynamically. Cool. Yeah. If you if you want to uh get more into colors, there's a great thing called Color Brewer which is uh, a good thing to look into. I'm not going to really talk much about it. But like these people thought a lot about colors. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. So what now we have things as different colors we can stack them on top of one another. But in order to do stack, uh, we need to use uh, the stack layout of D3. And this is like one of the trickier concepts. Like when you come across it and try to use it, like it's kind of a stumbling block to really get started. So I thought what I'd do here is really break it down to the basics. So there's not much code here. And what this is doing is it's reading in the data file, which is the same as before. And then instead of rendering anything, it's using d3.layout.stack. And so I spent a lot of time on this documentation page, um, and it's great. Uh, and there's a lot of documentation here. So stack layout, I would encourage you to like read through this if you start working with stack layout. But how you can use it is d3.layout.stack. When you call this, it creates a new instance of this layout, which will like transform your data. And when you say dot y, it's a, you're telling it, you're giving it a function that it can invoke on each data element to get the y value. And the y value is the thing that will be stacked. So if the first y value is 10, and then the second y value is like 20, and then the third value is something else, it'll compute like the, 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 the sum total of all the things that came before it and output that as what it calls y0. So here's how you specify the y accessor function, which is like, you know, the y column is population in this case. And then it's a little bit confusing because stack really works well on these two, two, um, two dimensional arrays. And this is like a degenerate case. Uh, but when you, you have to specify this function dot values, which is an accessor for the array of values for each top level 
entry. So imagine you have a two-dimensional array for each top-level array. The top-level array will get passed into this accessor function values, which should return the like nested array. So this is like for mapping different data structures to this. I know it's a little confusing. Can you give me an example that actually uses that? Yeah, the, the later examples will. But I just had to have this like this to get it to work in this like simple case. So it's returning an array. So the values accessor has to return an array. So I just I'm just returning an array that has one thing in it. Uh, which is the element from from the table. You know, it's an object that has these two fields, religion and population. And so it's a little confusing, I know. We'll we'll revisit this this dot values function. Um, but then once you've set it up, you can call it as a function with your data. In this case it's a it's an array. And so for each element of the array we'll call dot values to get an array of like the inner things. And then it will you know, do a data transformation, and this is the output. And so to display the output, I'm saying d3.selectBody.append pre. Pre is a tag that just displays uh, preformatted text like this with nice indentation and stuff. And I'm saying dot .text, you know, json.stringify this data. And these second two param parameters to json.stringify will tell it to do it like in a beautiful way with indentation. The indentation is two levels. So that's what we're seeing here. So this is the this is the output. This is the value of the stacked variable. So let's take let's just take a look. Like it's an array of objects, which is like pretty much the same thing as what we would see just from the parsed data, but it has these additional fields that have been added. It's y zero and y. So y is the y is just the value that comes out of the y accessor function. But y0 is the computed, like, stacked value. So if you look at, so if you think about, about it as a stack, uh, Christian here will be on the bottom of the stack. So it'll start at 0. But then the y0 of, this, of the next one will, it's the same value. See, 217, 217. So that will start where the previous one left off. And then the y0 for the third one will be the sum of the first two y's, or really it will be the y0 of the previous one plus the y of the previous one will be the y0 of the next one. And so this is what stack layout gives you, is this y0 thing. And it does this summing that you can use. So now with this value, this y0 thing, we can use this data to drive a stacked bar. And so this is what it looks like. If you take this chunk of code and put it back in the bar chart, you get this stacked bar, which is like the beginning of like a, a real stacked bar chart with multiple bars. So let's just take a look at the code here, um, how this is working. So there's the color column of religion, sort of the same as what we had before. And then in the render function, it's the co same code from the previous example. It's, um, yeah, computing the stack, getting the Y column, just getting the this array with a single element in it because the, the original data is not actually a nested structure. So this is all the same. And then to compute the domain of the Y scale, it's the D3.mac. So starting at zero and going up to yeah, actually, this 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 is a little a little bit tricky. So, the domain of the y scale is the first element of the array is this point here zero, and then the second element is the value of the data here. It's the maximum uh, value of all the summed things. And so, to get at to get at the data point that is really the tip top of the stack, what you need to do is take the maximum over this function uh, y0 plus y, so d dot y0 plus d dot y. So d dot y, if you, if you do um, just d dot y0, that'll be like the base of the top uh, element of the stack. But you have to add y to y0 to get the, the, the maximum value that you really want to use uh, with the scale. So this is how you compute the, the domain of the y scale. 
if the population were not uh, ordered, I mean, in this case it was a descending order, mm. if they were not descending order, is there a quick function to order them? Oh, yeah. So the question is, if, if it's not ordered, could you order it? Yeah, you could just use array.sort and give it a comparator that accesses the field that you want to sort by. Yeah, yeah. But like, yeah, it's just the data itself, the data table happens to be pre-sorted. So that's why the stack, the, the elements in the stack are sorted. But if it weren't, yeah, they might be like all different sizes, like in a non-sorted way. Yeah, yeah. But it wouldn't matter for our case because we're just trying to find the max value. So. Yeah, for the max... Yeah, this computation would be correct. It would be correct regardless of the sorting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, choosing the religion, it's just something that I've been always curious about. What is the breakdown of world of of religions in the world, you know? But it might be a little controversial. Like I hope people don't like send me death threats or something. <laughs> uh, right. So, so we've computed the scales, and now let's look at how the bars code has changed. So instead of, actually, maybe I should have renamed this bars to like pancakes or something. Uh, but it's still bars, really. So each element of this selection corresponds to one of these layers. And so it's a rectangle. We're using the range band still of the X scale. That's why it's like not going all the way to the outside. Same as before. And then. The x function is the same as before. We're just accessing the x column, which is world in this case. Oh, I didn't cover this, but I just added the region is world because that wasn't in the original data, um, just as an aside. That's why the world label is there. But getting back to the bars, so to compute the y attribute of each of these rectangles, now remember, the y value zero of the y value is at the top of the screen. And um, this inner height value would be at this baseline, the zero baseline. And so the y value is really the y scale of d dot y zero plus d dot y, which is the top of the rectangle, right? It, so we the, the d dot y zero is the bottom of the rectangle and d dot y itself is the height of the rectangle. So to get to the y position that's the top of the rectangle, you need to start at the bottom of the rectangle and add the height of the rectangle. So that's why it's like this, d dot y0 plus d dot y. So there, that's the top of the rectangle. And then we need to give it the height of the rectangle, because that's just how SVG works. It would be more convenient, maybe, if you could specify, like, y1, y2, but you just have to specify the height. So the, the, the way that we specify the height here is the inner height. So remember, if, if the height of the rectangle were inner height, it would be um, the height of this entire like box here inside of the margin. So it's inner height minus y scale of d dot y. So to be honest, like I just tweaked it until it looked like the right thing. <laughs> it's like kind of heady to to think about all of this. Oh, the width. So the width. Oh, actually, I set it in the enter virtual selection. That's not really right. It really should go down here. But the width is the range the range band from the x scale. And that's something I covered in the introduction to D3. So that's like when you specify the X scale, it's an it's a an ordinal scale, but with range bands, which specifies the bar padding, which is like I think right, so it's like one bar and that's the padding in front of the bar. Yeah, so the the bar padding is, is that's why it doesn't extend all the way to the edges. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, this, this code still throws me for a loop when I look at it. But it basically works, you know. <laughs> so like this is how you compute the height. It's the inner height minus the y scale. So th actually, the y scale of this <clears throat> value 
y scale of d dot y will give you the height of the rectangle. But you have to start at the inner height minus that because that's how this, the scale is set up, because the maximum value of the scale is the inner height. I mean, uh, where you are displaying it, I mean, based on the device you are going to display it. Maybe yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, so you're the question is, how do you do dynamic size in D3? And this is like beyond the scope of this tutorial, but this is something that I care about a lot, and I figured out how to do it. You can, you can do something where it responds to the resize like this by using CSS and then using browser event listeners. Um, but I'm not really going to cover this today. But in, this, in, the, in these code examples, the width and the height is just hard coded to be 500 and 250 just to fit in this little box, <laughs> which is like, I don't like doing it like this, but it's more complex code if you have it dynamically resizing. Let's just sort of press on and, and see how can we, how can we split this bar uh, horizontally? And so what we want is each bar to correspond to a country, and then that bar will be split just like this based on the religion uh, distribution within that country. And so how can we do that? So let's just add another dimension of the data. So I changed the data table now to be uh, this data, where there's two categorical fields, you know, or dimensions in this in this table, and there's one uh, measure if you if you take the data cube terminology. So yeah, it varies by country and religion. So each for each unique combination of country and religion, there's a value for population. This code here, all all it does is parses the data and then displays the parsed data. So once we parsed it, it's an array of objects, right? This is sort of standard when you parse it, a CSV file, you get an array of objects with country, religion, and population. But if you think about what we want to do, we want to basically take the previous example and split it out horizontally. And so the previous example deals with a single bar as, you know, the world. But what we want to do is like replicate that data structure, that's the input to the previous example, for each country individually. And the way that we can do that is using d3.nest. So here's where, this is another thing that's kind of like d3.layout.stack. It can be a little tricky when you come across it for the first time. So I just wanted to lay it out here, what it does. So here we're invoking d3.nest. And then with d3.nest, you can specify keys. And so with this dot key thing, and this is a function that returns the country. And this will be like the top level of the array. And each further key you specify, it, it gives you like this nested data structure, an array of arrays sort of a thing. It's sort of complex to explain. But there's this great uh, D3 nest set of examples that's really great for learning. Yeah, great. So if you just use one key, the value for the key is at the top level. So it's an array of objects that have key and values. And so key is the return value from the key function, and values is an array of values for which the key is that key. It's a group by. Yeah, it's a group by. It's a group by, exactly. And you can specify key twice here, so it's like a, a nested group by. So it's a it's like now it gives you a tree data structure where key values you know is at the top level and then for each entry in the values array it's a nested uh, version of that. But so far what we're going to do is just look at the single level of nesting. So what it looks like here is the key is China for the first entry in the top level array, and then the values for that are all the combinations of country and religion where country is China. So here we see China, China, China. And then the next uh, value in the top level array is all the values for India. India, 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 right? So, and this is how you invoke it. You say dot entries, data, and this is when it actually does the computation of the group by. And then 
the return value from all of that is this data structure. So this is how you can do like an in-memory group by sort of a thing in JavaScript in preparation for stacked bar charts that are split out. Oh, and so here's you can nest by country and then just by changing this to religion, you can nest by religion. I just wanted to show you can nest either way. So now it's like the top level thing is for each religion, all the different countries. So you could do it that way too. Um, but because of the way the data is, I wanted to have each bar correspond to a country, and then it, it would be split up by religion because that would that would sum to the population of that country. Whereas if we did it the other way around, because I'm just using the top five countries, it wouldn't sum to the complete population for each religion. So, But anyway, you can use nest and stack together. And this is what you need to do to create a stacked bar chart. And so here's a variant where we're nesting by Oh, I introduced a variable called layer column because we want to sort of make it more generic. And here it's religion. So each thing on the top level is a religion and each value. So the, the overall structure is the same as before, but now we're passing it through d3.layout.stack, which will assign these y0 values that we need to like build up the bars. And so d3.layout.stack, the y accessor is d at the y column which here is population. And then the dot values accessor here is different from the first stack example. Now it's returning d dot values. And this is the more idiomatic thing that you would encounter when using the stack layout. Um, so d dot values is this array, right? So for each element of the top level array, the values that it will use are you know, in the values property of that element of the array. So it's like a little quirky, but like this is how you just how you use d3.nest and d3.stack. And so when you pass everything through, this is the data structure you get. And this is how we actually want to do the nesting for the stacked bar chart, because if you look at the y0 values for all of the Christian entries, they're all going to be zero, right? So that's because the Christian thing will be the the first uh, the first like slab of this of this layout. You know, it's going to start at the bottom of y zero is zero for all of these, and then you call it Christian slabs. Uh, <laughs> well, the first layer, you know, the first layer. Okay, and then the second layer will be the the Muslim entries, and so the y zero for these will be will be higher. I know, it's not politically correct, right? <laughs> but you got to visualize it somehow. Maybe I should just randomize it so it's different every time. <laughs> so this is a little bit tricky because the top level grouping is by religion. And so when we do the code for the bars, it'll be a little odd. You know, it's not every entry for a country, it's every entry for a religion. So let's just take a look how you do stacked bar. So here's, here's what it looks like. So just observe this for a second. Like I was amazed when I actually saw this data for the first time. Actually in the next example I add a legend. I'll just show it to you now so you can read the chart. So it's just, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating thing to look at. You can see that like in the US, most people are Christian and also in Brazil. Yeah, isn't it interesting? Most of the people in China are unaffiliated. Yeah, right. It's because the, I don't know, the cultural revolution. <laughs> I, I, I also, this is a really good example of choosing the correct visualization mm. because it reveals stuff that would be hard to see in the numbers. Oh, yeah. And I've had this data kicking around in some folder for a long time, and I, I never saw the structure of it like this. So it was really fascinating for me like to just make this chart and, and just look at it, you know, and see how many Hindus there are in India. <laughs> yeah. 
This is a side question. Um, so now all all those data that you had lying everywhere is now in your data repository. Or data. Oh, so it's worth mentioning that um, all of the data for this project is in this uh, GitHub repository called data. And I have a lot of data sets that I've sort of collected over the years in here, and I want to visualize all of them. <laughs> but it's like, you know, it's hard to, hard, to, hard to do it all. But this religion data set is in here under um, Pew, where is it? Pew Religion. I'm afraid that this is not starred as much as it's supposed to be. <laughs> 45 stars. Well, it's, I think it's not that accessible. But inside of this directory is the processing script that I used to prepare this exact uh, data. Because the original data has like for all countries of the world. And so I just limited it to be the top five. But if you look at um, the original data, you can see there's entries for every single country in the world. So this would be fascinating to really look through in more detail. It would also be interesting to show if each country is the same block and it would have a few percentage. Because then you could see it's... Yeah, right. That's true. Like, rather than having them get smaller, they could all be the same size. So you could just see the breakdown within each country. Yeah, that'd be really interesting. Let's look at the code here and see how this stacked layout thing is working. Right? So it's the same data structure we were looking at before. So in the render function, we're, we're, you, we're doing the same thing as the previous example. We're nesting and then stacking the data. And then the result is in this, uh, this variable called layers. So each layer here is the set of bars that's the same color. Okay. So the first entry in the layers array is corresponds to all of the blue rectangles. Not the countries, but the sets of similarly colored rectangles. Um, so computing the X scale domain is fairly straightforward because like, we're taking the first uh, layer and for the values of the first layer, just extracting the value for the X column, which is the countries. So like layers at, at index zero will be, I think, uh, the Christian entries. And so the va values of that is the list of countries, right? What would happen if they didn't have any that would be zero? If all the values were zero, I mean, this, the, the list of countries would still be there. Yeah, the stack layout, like if the population were zero, 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 it would still, they would still have entries, but the values would just be zero. So now we're just looking at the... the so it's arbitrary, <laughs> whichever layer you took, you take the last one. Right. I'm just taking the first one, because that's... Just the only way I could really see how to do it. It's a it maybe it always doesn't feel quite right if I access the first element of an array, but like I don't know. It's just it made sense. So this is how we're getting the list of countries. You know, China, India, USA. That's the X scale domain, and then the Y scale domain. This is the min and max of the Y scale, right? So. Deep inside here is the same logic we had before, but it's applied to the values for each layer. And we're doing a, a nested d3.max. Because what we're doing here is, for each inner call here, we're computing the value at the top of each country bar. And then we're taking the max over all of those. So let's look at the code. <clears throat> the the y-scale domain <clears throat> is an array where the first entry is 0, the second entry is a d3.max of this function over each layer. Um, so for each layer, we're looking at all the values. And each entry in this values array has this y0 and y computed by the stack layout. And then the sum of y0 and y is the top of the rectangle. So this inner d3.max is computing uh, the maximum value. Um, well, you're summing over each one of them just to get the top itself, right? Yeah, you're, you're, you're going over all the layers for also each one, uh, summing all the countries just to get what's the, what's the total of that country. Well, actually, let's look at the, the previous example. So 
that layers thing is this array here, right? Where the, the values array is each different country within a particular religion. So if we go back and look at this, um, each entry in layers is a religion. And um, so like each time this function gets invoked, layer is, for example, uh, Christian. It's the, the, it's all the entries for the blue rectangles, right? So the max of this call will be, in the first iteration, it'll be this, this value here for USA. And then the second iteration through the layers array would be all of these um, uh, orange squares. So the top value would be maybe this one. Uh, and then it, it'll go through everything. Actually, now that I think about it, I could just take the last the last entry in layers. Actually, by the way, let me just say, I took this from this example, stacked to grouped bars by Mike Bostock, where he solved the same problem. <clears throat> and you can actually transition between stacked and grouped. It's really crazy. And uh, <clears throat> he had the same function here, d3.max layers for each layer, return the max of y0 plus, and it gets cut off others. So I basically took the same logic from here, but it took me a while to understand it. But yeah, I think you're right. You need do. I think you do need to look at all of them because the ordering might. Yeah. I don't know. You you. Think of it as calling the height of China, because it ends up being the biggest. But if you didn't know that, it might. Right. Right. So what is the inner the inner max? You can just get the last element. Yeah, that's what I just occurred to me right now. Because the why not and the why would be the highest point of that of each country. Yeah. So into the other maps, mm -hmm. and it complicates the maps of all the countries. So one is just is a sum. You got to find out which one's the highest. So maybe it could look like this, and you could get rid of one level. And then you reduce uh, computation. Yeah, that might work actually. Food for thought, <laughs> right? <laughs> Why, I guess, my boss can do what he did. I should try this and see if it works, because intuitively, the, the last layer is the highest layer. Food for thought, but I'm glad we got into this, because we're really understanding this a little better. It gets confusing with these. Yeah, but they must be ordered that way because this was passed through uh, the stack layout. Interesting. I didn't see that before. Fork the block. Yeah, fork my block. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is how you compute the domain of the Y scale. Now, this is where we get into the D3 stuff. So. If you look at the DOM here, there's a, a layer group element for each of these uh, layers. So if you look at the DOM by clicking inspect element, we can see that there's a layer, a group element here that contains all the blue rectangles. Okay. And then if we were to look at the next layer, it contains all of the uh, orange rectangles. Okay, so this organization is, for me, it was counterintuitive. I wanted to have one group per country. But because the way that it's computed with the stack layout has to be like this instead, which I was, it was a little confusing. But here's how you do it. So for each... Um, so we so G is the container for the stuff that's inside of the margin here. And then G dot select all dot layer. So we're selecting all the elements that have a class of layer, which there's none in the beginning. And then we do a data a data join with the layers. And then on the enter a virtual selection, we're appending a group element and giving it a class of layer. 
And so this is the D3 enter exit update thing. And then in the update cycle here, we're, we're saying that the fill style of all the stuff that will be in this group will be set to, you know, evaluate the color scale of D.key. And remember, D.key is the value we passed in here for uh, the key of the nest, which is the layer column, which is, um, in this case, it's religion. It's layering by religion. And it's going across, the X, the X scale would be country. The layers is religion, which is the same as the color column. So, um, so it's interesting. If you see the rec the rect elements, there's no fill attribute. It's the fill is applying to the group. So once we have the groups, um, we're doing a nested selection. So this is this is really cool, but also really a little tricky to understand, like this nested selection idea. Uh, but Mike Bostock has this really great elaborate post on this, uh, this whole concept of nested selections. So you could do like a select all dot select all like this. Um, so you could do these nested selections. So let's see how it plays out in this case. So the top level selection is these layers. So, all right, we created a layer group for each religion. And then for each layer group, we want to add all the rectangles that correspond to the diff different countries for that group. And so we're doing layer groups dot select all rect dot data. So we're doing a data join on a function. And that function gets called for every entry in the, the the higher level of the selection. So for each layer entry, so D here, maybe I should really call it layer. It's an entry in in that uh, in that data structure that we had with the key and the values. So we're extracting the values for that particular layer, and then so each entry in the values array will correspond to one rectangle here, and then we do the enter exit thing, and then uh, the D that we're dealing with in these functions is the lowest level of detail. You know, it's a combination of religion and country. And so we can extract the X column, which is country. And then for Y, we can use the same logic as we did before, in, in just where it was just a single bar. So the Y is the Y scale uh, at the Y0 plus Y. You know, the bottom of the rectangle plus the height of the rectangle, which is d.y. Um, and then this is all the same stuff as before, really. And so it's just this logic of the nested selection that you really got to grok, grok. So here's how you do stacked bar charts. And for me, like, I've always wanted to make a stacked bar chart, but I never could figure it out. And it's like the holy grail for me, you know? Like, <laughs> Uh, but now I finally feel like I understand it. It's pretty laborious, though. Yeah, it is. To really understand it, it's it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. No, these are these examples are designed to be copied and, and and modified. I plan to release all of these as blocks, so that you can just fork them and and work with them. I'm just surprised that D3 doesn't have more of a domain specific language. Yeah. You have to what you want. Right, I know, I know. It's such a, it's a big distance. Yeah, and that's why I think that you have so many libraries built on top of D3 where people desire a higher level, like a grammar of graphics. Yeah. There was that great book, The Grammar of Graphics by Leland Wilkinson, where he defined us exactly a language where you could define these things. Stacked bars is just like, when you want to expand it like this, it's just like adding a one little thing in some algebra, right? That's really how it should be. Yeah. But... I mean, so this is how you, well, yeah, I mean, because you can do it like this in D3, you can make a higher level language like that. Which case is this a block type in Hyacinth? 
<laughs> oh, it will be. <laughs> so in the Kaizen project, I want to make all of these available as plugins, or maybe ideally have like a grammar-based system, but it's I haven't quite got there yet. I haven't quite figured it out. The best is Google Drive exception. If you just put some data, mm. in, some data, it will actually give you a recommendations of what kind of plot. Yeah, I saw that. They recently rolled out this like automatic thing. Yeah, it's so cool. It automatically generates these visualizations for you. So now that we have a stacked bar chart, uh, <laughs> which religion is green again? <laughs> oh, you guys know. Well, if you didn't know, <laughs> we have to add a color legend. So this is how you add a color legend. So there was a recent project done called D3 Legend by uh, Susie Liu. So this is an open source thing, and it's extremely well documented. And you can make legends like this without writing your own D3 code for it. You can just sort of invoke her uh, library, and it's very well documented. It's, it's Beautiful, beautiful work. But anyway, I'm going to use that. And um, a while ago, I made this block that just uses D3 Legend. Just I wanted to figure out how how it looked like to use it. And so it's just including a script, and then you say color legend equals D3 dot legend dot color, which is from this library. And then you just configure it with all these various parameters. Uh, one of them is that you pass in the scale. You pass in the label format and like the padding between shapes, the shape width, the shape height, all these little things that you can tweak. You know, so that's what gives you this nice color legend. So I'm not writing any D3 that renders these rectangles. Like that's all inside of that library, and we can just use it. And so to to actually add that here, so I added a script tag to include that library, um, and then. I, you know, added some CSS to make it a nice looking font and like set the size of the font for this thing that has a class color legend that I added, let's see, below. So I added a group, color legend G is a group element that has a class color legend so we can use CSS on it and then just transforming it by this translation that just moves it to be in a certain location uh, that I just tweaked until it looked nice, you know. And then um, the color scale was there before. And here's the configuration of the color legend. Just you know, creating the legend and passing in our color scale that we had before. And then just setting up all these little configuration parameters so it looks just right. How would you reverse it? Uh, make it upside down. Uh, how would you reverse it? Uh, on the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. Actually, I wanted to do that. It, it, you're right. Well, the, the issue here is the ordering in, within each bar is not the same as the ordering in the legend. They're opposite. They're reversed. Um, and you can do that if you were to um, reverse it at some point in here. And I didn't go through and do it, but you can do it. I actually did that for a later example that we'll cover. Well, maybe we won't cover it. It's taking a long time to go through these. You can just do a dot reverse somewhere in here. That will reverse the array. But you need to be careful to do it at the right spot. Because <laughs> otherwise it reverses in both. You know. Uh, you just have to go through and figure, figure out where to reverse an array. <laughs> yeah, color legend G dot call which is a D3 pattern where you use the library color legend. And so it's it's very easy. You know, Suzy Lu has created a great API for legends and I'm just using it here. So legendary. it's legendary. <laughs> it is. But before this you had to write a bunch of code like you were asking about to like get the offset just right and like make the rectangle the right size and so she encapsulated that and I'm just using it here. So that, that's how you add a color legend. Let's see, grouped bars. So this whole stacked bar thing draws from this um, stacked to grouped bars example from Mike Bostock, where it actually has this sweet transition. And so I just uh, studied this example 
and you just have to modify in a few places to switch it between stacked and grouped bars. And so I'll just go through this code for grouped bars. So here it is, grouped bars. It's presenting the same data, but just uh, in a different, different organization, different layout. So this is not using the Y0 property because it's putting everything at the baseline of, of the axis. Let's just go through and see where things had to change. Well, if you look at the stack to grouped, we can see that, um, right, when we're, when we're computing the max value for the y-axis, instead of d.y0 plus y, we're just using d.y. So, right here it is, the y-scale. It's just using d.y here because d.y is the height of the bar here. And so we want to take the max <coughs> over all the bars, basically, and get the largest bar and make that the, the, the highest value for the uh, domain of the Y scale. And then here, um, we need to offset each bar a little bit. And this is something that I, I learned, I didn't know you could do. There's a J property that's exposed in these callbacks. And so, with D3, usually it's a function that operates on a data element D, right? And the second argument to this function is I, the index in the array. But when you use nested selections, you actually get J, which is the index of the, like, the parent selection, which, like, it's so cool. Like, I didn't know you could do that. And so... I split out the computation of bar width here. So before the bar width was just x scale dot range band, which is like the full, the full width of the bar in the previous example. So we're taking that and we're dividing it by the number of entries in the color scale domain, which is, I could have referenced that in some other way, uh, but it's basically the number of religions. So it's dividing that the width of the bar by the number of religions to get you the width of this, this smaller bar that we want here. And then we're, um, we're computing the x scale of the value for the x column and then offsetting it by bar width times j. j is um, the index of the element in the parent selection with these nested selections. And so bar width times j will offset the bar. Right, And so this is how you compute the x offset for these bars. Um, and then in this, the rest of the code, uh, we just removed y0 from the whole thing. So we're not using y0. We're not, we're not using that part of the stack layout. Actually, we're not using the stack layout at all. We could take out the stack layout part, because it's just, just nested data, really. Um, Actually, I, never, I didn't think of that before, but we don't need the stack layout because we're not using Y0. Um, so yeah, this is how you, you do grouped bars. It's just a slight modification of stacked bars. What uh, can they really find useful for? Because that, for this specific case, the one before was stacked. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not as interesting to read in a way. And I, I think... Uh, it's a matter of like aesthetics and it depends on the data. I think it really depends a lot on the data because uh, in cases where there's very little variation between them, like, I mean, it would be interesting to find a data set where this would give you a more readable theme because this lets you compare directly the height of each adjacent bar. And so, yeah. Where I've seen it do really good is comparison of various operations in various browsers, like array.sort in mm. Firefox or IE or whatever, because um, the values are, are closer together. It would show you, this would be good for where data is not so widely disparate as it was. On, on, on that one, because there was like Brazil had hardly any in most of the, the categories. 
But if you wanted to see, like, is a race or faster in Firefox or Safari, um, various other operations, it, it would be useful. Staying with your religion and geography, um, I think if you took different counties in the United States. That's a beautiful thing about this theme because you can you can you can look at different levels of detail. Like each one of these could be a U.S. state or a U.S. county or a city, even. Um, and it it it, it, could, it doesn't need to be religions. Like you could look at different uh, ethnicities, also, and do the same kind of uh, visualization. That might be interesting. Sorry, to break down things like Mormon and stuff like that, or it all follows your Pew has hundreds of data sets, and so maybe somewhere in there, there's something like that where it breaks down Christianity into the sub s uh, denominations. Thank you. <laughs> See, I'm not very politically correct. But, uh, you know, but that's actually the beauty, beauty of like the data cube conceptual framework. So like this is not using any OLAP anything, but if you were, it would be storing those hierarchies and you could use the, the OLAP queries to like navigate down into these nested structures, like breaking down Christian into the denominations or breaking down the country into the regions within the country. Because maybe, I don't know, maybe in China, like, Certain regions, like maybe it different, maybe the region regions differentiate themselves a lot more when you break it down. I don't know. Uh, in order to see all countries, do you think what's the best way to just plot all countries like this horizontally? Well, if you wanted to see, yeah, the question is, if you wanted to see all countries, how might you approach that? Um, I've seen Tableau do it, where. Instead of vertical bars, it's this this exact visualization, but it's horizontal bars. And then it just, you can scroll and make the bars smaller, maybe. So make the bars half this size, make it horizontal, and then have it scrollable. Because it's going to scroll off the screen. There's like 200 something. How many countries? 200 something. <laughs> So it would scroll off the page, but you would probably see like a power law distribution sort of a thing where it's like most of the population are in like the top 10 countries and then it sort of peters off. <laughs> but actually, I have all the data there if you look in the repository. So you, I would leave that as an exercise for the reader like to actually do that because it's totally possible. It's not that hard to do. You would just have to, you would just have to enable scrolling or something. Yeah. Yeah, and I had one thought actually. Well, I don't know if it's worth getting into, but like if you had if you had all the countries, it would probably be like big ones, and then it gets smaller and smaller, and then you have a bunch of white space there, so you could use that space maybe to plot the smaller countries. I don't know, just maybe, like a uh, concept. So you could go like uh, like a continent, like Europe, Asia. Yeah. All right. So that yeah, if you wanted to visualize the whole world, you could use continents instead and maybe have it so you can like drill down to each continent. There's a lot of different ways you could approach that, like but how do you represent all countries? It's kind of like a deep question of like visualization. Um, yeah, it really depends on the task, what you're looking for. You use your charting library and have one graph. Yeah, linked views. Linked views could be... That's what the power of linked views, because like if you have one view at the level of continents, you could sort of hover, and then maybe that would like show you a bar chart of the countries in that particular continent. Yeah, that's the the project I'm working on with linked views, chiasm. It, ena it enables you to have multiple charts where if you interact in one, it'll like influence the the other one. Uh, but yeah, this is beyond the scope. <laughs> Let's see. I've gone for an hour and a half now. I have forty examples. <laughs> So I think I didn't quite scope it right with the timing. Let's see. Let's just let me just show you what I what I would cover is circles, coloring the circles, pie layout, uh, small multiples, and this variant of a pie chart with fixed. Uh, I didn't do anything 3D. <laughs> And then, then it's applying the same pattern with the stacked bars and the grouped bars to pie to pie charts and donut charts. So yeah, I think I'll just leave it, leave it at grouped bars, and maybe I'll leave this uh, all this other stuff for the subsequent 
event, <laughs> you know. Thank you so much for coming out. You know, we had some great discussions. <laughs> All right, take care.